All right, guys, welcome to our uh, sixth episode of the Washington University Nephrology web episode. Here's another renal pathology teaching series. Um, I have a slightly different format today. I kind of got a little bit behind with my clinical work, and I was not able to scrounge up Dr. Gott and a fellow to discuss a case. I do have an excellent case prepared for you, so I will be running through it kind of on my own. The images here, again, are courtesy from Dr. David Simbaluk at Rush, and I have also included a few images from Heptonstall's Pathology of the Kidney. So before we get started, again, shout out to our sponsors. Big major shout out to the AJKD blog for hosting this year's Nef Madness. It was a very exciting game last night between UNC and Villanova, and it is a very exciting Nef Madness. If you haven't heard of this, please check that out. It's sponsored by the AJKD blog. Please also look at the Nephrology Journal Club and well-known renal blogs Nephron Power and the Renal Fellow Network. Here is an image of the current number one standing of the uh, Nef Madness bracket. My bracket is completely busted. Um, I'm not even going to show it because it's somewhat embarrassing how bad it is. So let's jump right into the case here. I have a 55 year old male with recently diagnosed IgM multiple myeloma who's presenting with nephrotic syndrome and swelling over the past four weeks. The exam reveals a 30 pound weight gain with 3 plus edema, a creatinine of 1.5. The baseline creatinine two months ago is 1.2. Urinalysis reveals 3 plus protein and hyaline casts seen on sediment, but otherwise no other active urine sediment. The urine albumin to creatinine ratio is 8 grams per gram. The urine protein to creatinine ratio is 10 grams per gram. So there are about three things that I want to point out from this one-liner. One is that we're not dealing with your typical multiple myeloma, which is usually an IgG and maybe a kappa or a lambda restriction. This is an IgM multiple myeloma, which is a little bit more unusual. Two is that the presentation here is more consistent with the nephrotic syndrome rather than acute kidney injury. The creatinine is up a bit, but not too significant, and again, the main uh, complaint here is the swelling and the edema. Lastly, we have provided you here with an albumin to creatinine ratio and a protein to creatinine ratio. And this is important because remember in monoclonal gammopathies, when you have excess production of light chains, you can oftentimes end up with an overflow proteinuria uh, where you would be quantified at a protein to creatinine ratio of whatever, five, six, seven, eight grams, and your dipstick might be po uh, negative. But here I'm showing you that we have significant albuminuria, which does actually mean we are dealing with the nephrotic syndrome. So before I jump into the case, I want to bring up this slide to kind of demonstrate my thought process when I'm dealing with a monoclonal gammopathy and kidney injury. There are a lot of diseases that can um, uh, be associated with myeloma. But the big three are cast nephropathy, light chain deposition disease, and amyloidosis. And when we look at the distinguishing clinical characteristics, there are a couple things that pop out at us. The first is that cast nephropathy presents with rapidly advanced creatinine. So these patients oftentimes will have a creatinine that's very high, uh, as opposed to the light chain and amyloidosis diseases. Not normal by any means, but typically are not um, dom predominated by acute kidney injury. What's normally seen is uh, in deposition diseases like amyloidosis and light chain, you have predominantly a nephrotic state rather than in cast nephropathy, which is unusual to have a nephrotic syndrome, usually presents with acute renal failure. So already with our with our, our history, with a history of nephrotic syndrome and a normal creatinine, my mind is thinking less less about cast nephropathy and more about some of these deposition diseases. So let's see what the biopsy shows. Here, uh, I'm, I, so and then I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on each of these slides. First of all, I'm not a nephropathologist, but I should be able to interpret them well enough for you that you can pick up the teaching uh, pearls that I want to convey. So what we're seeing here is a low power trichrome. And at this power, the trichrome is really only useful for for looking at the degree of fibrosis. If you had significant interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, a lot of this stain would look blue. And fortunately, we aren't seeing a whole lot of that. You can see areas of tubular preservation here. We can see some glomeruli here at these low powers. It's too 
low power to really comment on the architecture. But what we can say from this is that there is not a lot of chronic fibrosis, which is not something that we would expect given that this patient's creatinine is relatively preserved at this time of the disease. So here we have a higher power H&E. Uh, the H&E stain really highlights the cells. And what we see in this H&E is one glomerulus. And what is most striking about this glomerulus is that we are dealing with what appears to be a nodular glomerulus sclerosis. So you can see nodules here with the cells pushed to the periphery. And we also see this area, which doesn't really look like your typical nodular glomerulus sclerosis, but you can see the cells pushed to the end. This looks a little bit more amorphous to me, and that's a big red flag when we're thinking about diseases like amyloidosis. So let's look at another H&E here. Again, this H&E demonstrates uh, one glomerulus here in the center, and again, you see these nodules with the cells pushed to the periphery. Here is a PAS stain, um, and you, know, you can tell that this is a PAS because of the highlighting of Bowman's capsules, the highlighting of the tubular basement membrane. Um, again, you see this large nodule within the glomerulus. This also demonstrates nicely this vessel here, which is uh, very thickened and, and demonstrates uh, severe arteriosclerosis. Here's another um, PAS. Okay, so this doesn't look normal either, but um, is uh, not something that you would typically see in multiple myeloma. So what we see here, again in the glomerulus, is this is the glomerular tuft, and there is this cellular proliferation on the outside in Bowman's uh, space, and it's multiple cell layers thick. And so this represents, to me, a cellular crescent. Um, so remember, a crescent just implies a rupture of the basement membrane, which leads to an inflammatory process within the Bowman space. Uh, and if, over time, this crescent and this inflammation will eventually destroy this glomerulus. Um, the crescent does not tell you what the disease is. It just implies that Bowman's, um, uh, that, the, that the capillary loop has been ruptured and there's inflammation within Bowman space. Now here is a silver or a Jones stain, and this is extremely important in this case because we're dealing with a nodular glomerulosclerosis. So you don't see the nodules here, all right? So here we see this hyaline material, which does not stain silver positive. And this is a really important stain when you're dealing with a nodular glomerulosclerosis because diseases like diabetic nephropathy, which would lead to chemosyl Wilson nodules, uh, remember those are made up of collagen and the silver stain stains for collagen. So a diabetic nephropathy patient on a silver stain would show that those nodules would be big, black, and staining positive on the silver. So the absence of stain on this silver suggests that we are not dealing with a collagenous disease and that those deposits may be made up of something else, um, light chains, for example. So the stains that we would need to sometimes uh, specially request in a disease such as this when we're entertaining diagnoses such as amyloidosis would include the Congo red. And that's what I'm going to show you now. So this is a Congo red stain. It is uh, sometimes routine at some institutions, but not always. But whenever you're dealing with a myeloma disease or a disease where you would suspect amyloidosis, you need to make sure you get the Congo red. So this is the Congo red stain. Uh, and you can already see that there's these nodules, but this is not under polarized light. When you view this image under polarized light, these deposits all of a sudden look like apple green birefringence. That's the you know textbook words that you'll hear to describe amyloidosis. So this is the Congo red stain under polarized light. And this is not subtle in this case, although sometimes amyloid can be subtle and it can deposit in areas outside of the glomerulus as you can see here. Um, and this is the same type of stain you would look 
for amyloid if you did a fat pad biopsy and were looking for uh, amyloidosis and trying to make the diagnosis via fat pad biopsy, you would still do a Congo red and look at it under polarized light for these uh, deposits. Here's an immunostain for amyloid protein. Uh, it is not routine, and you do not need this for the diagnosis of amyloidosis. But uh, you can see here, if you did do this special immunostain, you have these dark spots which are staining positive for the amyloid. So moving on from light microscopy now to immunofluorescence, uh, this is an IgM restricted immunofluorescent pattern. So remember this patient had IgM monoclonal protein, uh, IgM myeloma. And so if you had a disease like IgG lambda myeloma, which is strongly associated with amyloidosis, um, you would have the light chain restriction to whichever monoclonal protein was being overproduced by the bone marrow. Here is electron microscopy. And again, the first thing I do with EM is always to orient myself. But I will admit that even um, though I've looked at thousands of EM pictures, it is difficult to orient yourself when you have so much going on here. What I can tell you is that this is the capillary loop. This is the endothelial space. These are your foot processes. So this would be your blood space, capillary loop, basement membrane, and this is your urine space. And there's so much stuff going on in this area. Uh, and this is um, important to look at at a higher power, which we're going to do next. So this is a close-up view of one of those nodules. And it, in essence, what it is is a, an enormous deposit. So normally in diseases like membranous or IgA, we're, we're looking at the capillary loop. We're searching for deposits. This whole thing is an enormous deposit. And you can already start to see that it looks grainy at this power. And it's important in these disease states to look at it under higher power because it can have an, uh, a very specific organized substructure. So here again is a higher power of one of those nodules and you can, al you can start to see the substructure here. That it almost looks like someone took a pile of little tiny twigs and threw them on the ground and they just landed there in a randomly arranged pattern. And so if you go to even higher power, you can see nicely that these are randomly arranged fibrils. And these fibrils have a particular size which is important in differentiating what disease process this is. We already can assume that this is an amyloid disease because of the Congo red positive stain. But this really just demonstrates it and puts it in the, in the you know, textbook category, that these fibrils are between 9 and 13 nanometers in diameter. So we're dealing with diameter, not length. The diameter of these fibrils is between 9 and 13 nanometers. So the diagnosis, summing up what we saw in the, on the light microscopy, we saw a nodular glomerulosclerosis with a negative silver stain and a positive Congo red. The immunofluorescence was IgM restricted and the electron microscopy demonstrated deposits uh, that were uh, randomly arranged fibrils of approximately 10 nanometers in size. So all of that fits with the diagnosis of renal amyloid. So renal amyloid is a result of amyloid precursors which are folded into a beta pleated sheet leading to this fibrillary formation. And the precursor proteins that lead to amyloid uh, can be, there are a lot of them, but oftentimes are a monoclonal protein. And so whenever you see amyloidosis, you should be, your reflex should be, I should make sure this patient does not have multiple myeloma or an MGUS that could be causing this. There are other diseases, um, specifically chronic inflammatory diseases like chronic inflammatory bowel disease, Long-standing Crohn's and ulcerative colitis can lead to amyloid deposition, familial Mediterranean fever, rheumatoid arthritis. There's a whole slew of chronic inflammatory conditions that also can lead to amyloidosis. 
this uh, case really showed nicely the histology. Again, on light, you have a nodular glomerular sclerosis with this amorphous proteinaceous deposition, which we saw. Again, to differentiate that from diabetes, which can also be nodular, the stain in the silver stain is negative in uh, amyloid, whereas it would be positive in diabetes. And the Congo red uh, clinches it. If you see the deposit staining apple green by refringent, it is indeed amyloidosis. Now, if you had nodular glomerulosclerosis, negative silver stain, and a negative Congo red, you might then be dealing with what we have categorized as light chain deposition disease, which is very similar to amyloid, except it does not stain for Congo red. So essentially those precursors are not being folded into the beta pleated sheet, which results in the amyloid formation. Immunofluorescence might demonstrate a restriction to the particular immunoglobulin th uh, that is being overproduced by the bone marrow if you're dealing with a monoclonal gammopathy. And again, on EM you will see these organized, randomly arranged fibrils, which in amyloid are approximately 10 nanometers in diameter. There are diseases that uh, lead to organized deposits that are not amyloid, so I would like to just highlight quickly two of them because this is a board's, a nephrology board's favorite. So a disease called fibrillary glomerulonephritis has um, a very similar presentation to amyloid. If you look at this picture, it looks exactly the same. They're still randomly arranged. They're still in these small um, uh, nodular uh, nodules that you would see. However, the size of the fibrils, instead of being approximately 10 nanometers, now is approximately 20 nanometers. And again, this would not stain in the Congo red. Um, a disease called immunotactoid glomerulopathy uh, has much larger fibrils, greater than 30 nanometers, and sometimes even as high as 60. And here's a picture of that. These two images are taken from heptan salts. And you can see here that these fibrils are of a very different appearance than the fibrils of fibrillar and amyloid. They almost are described as having a microtubular appearance. And if you look at them kind of from front to back, like here, you can almost see that they have a hollow lumen, uh, which correlates with this much larger diameter of the fibrils. So these are th three diseases that can all lead to organized deposits. Uh, I remember the size, amyloid 10, fibrillary 20, immunotectoid 30, because that's the order that A, amyloid, F, fibrillary, I, immunotectoid comes in the alphabet. So as you go up in the alphabet, the size of the fibrils gets bigger. And so that wraps up the case. Um, I want to thank you guys for watching. Again, if you have any uh, questions or recommendations, please feel free to comment on the video. You can also email me here at tyau at dom.wusel.edu. Follow us on the YouTube channel, Wash U Nephrology, and subscribe to be informed when we have new content. And feel free to tweet me at maximal underscore change. And we will see you guys with the next episode. Thanks.